Well, I, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, good afternoon and welcome back to the 2021 City Center Speaker Series. I'm Susan Edmondson, CEO of Downtown Partnership of Colorado Springs, uh, filling in today for Claire Swinford. And for those of you joining us for the first time this evening, uh, Downtown Partnership is a nonprofit organization that has served the Urban Center of Colorado Springs for decades, working to ensure that downtown continues to benefit the whole community as the economic, civic, and cultural heart of the region. In a time of transformation for Colorado Springs, it's our pleasure to offer you this speaker series as a point of connection to help us all understand our roles in ensuring our city continues to change for the better in this new decade. For the past six years, the City Center Series has invited nationally renowned experts in urbanism, innovation, and design to speak to the concerns of our neighbors, community advocates, elected officials, students, and industry leaders, and get them to communicate in more informed and inspired ways. Our goal with the City Center Series is to make the conversation about our developing city center uh, ever more thoughtful and inclusive. We're especially excited to present this year's speakers entirely online because we know it means a lot of you in the audience are able to join us for the first time. So we're so glad you're here. Like all the other public benefit programs of Downtown Partnership, the City Center Series is made possible by our members. These are local businesses, regional employers, and community-minded individuals who believe, as we do, that Colorado Springs does best when its downtown is thriving, and they play an active role in our mission. Members that are here today, thank you for joining us. And special thanks go out to our President's Council members who support downtown at the highest level. Membership is open to everyone. So if you're intrigued by what you hear tonight and want to be more involved, you can become a member online at downtowncs.com slash membership. This year's speaker series would not be possible without the support of the Colorado Springs Business Journal and the Colorado Springs Health Foundation, our presenting sponsor. We wanna thank CSHF, not only for thy financial support, but also for the inspiration to think bigger and do better as we explore how our whole community benefits when we pay attention to resiliency, equity, and creative placemaking. And thanks also to our community partners who have supported us by spreading the word about this series to their stakeholders. I'd like to recognize the Council of Neighbors and Organizations, our sponsor for today's talk. Kono empowers neighbors and neighborhoods to take action in their communities through education and connection, developing safe, healthy, thriving places to live. You can learn more and get involved at cscono.org. We're also joined tonight by Tila Larson, Senior Analyst for the City of Colorado Springs, Department of Parks, Recreation and Cultural Services. Tila will be moderating the Q&A at the end of tonight's session. So if you have questions for our speaker, please feel free to drop those in the Zoom chat. Please do remember our community guidelines and keep your comments brief, polite, and on topic. So for now, um, please mouse over the upper right-hand corner of your screen to enter speaker view so you can have the best possible visuals. And a final note before we get started, this is the last event in this year's series, but we'll be back next January with a new slate of timely topics and speakers. In the meantime, you can watch previous events in the City Center series on our website, downtowncs.com slash city center. If you're curious about other downtown partnership events, you can also take that opportunity to sign up for our newsletter and follow us on Facebook and Instagram. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Keisha Pollock Porter, Professor of Health Policy and Management at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. That's a mouthful. Dr. Pollock Porter's work looks uh, specially at how public space design impacts public health. And she uses her research to help communities make policies that promote equity and safety where people live, work, play, and travel. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Keisha Pollock-Porter. Susan, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. I am grateful to be here with all of you today. Let me go ahead and share my screen. 
Um, and can I get a thumbs up or a wave if I sound okay? Are you hearing me okay today? Perfect, thank you. All right, let's see. Sorry, you know, we, we just did this right before and then that little green button went away. It's so weird. All right, let me try, let me stop. Hold on one second, everyone. All right, here we go. I have two screens, so let me make sure that little green button comes back at the bottom of this once I hit this share screen. Perfect. All right. Okay. All right, I'm seeing nodding, so that means you can see my screen. Um, all right. So again, thank you so much to the Downtown Partnership of Colorado Springs. I wanna thank all of the other partners and in particular want to thank the Council of Neighbors and Organizations for sponsoring this session. I am just thrilled to be here today, excited for this presentation. Thank you for giving me space to lift up these issues around health equity and public health. And I look forward to the Q&A with Tila at the end. I wanna to begin today by just honoring beautiful Colorado Springs. I wish that I was there in person. Um, I've never been to Colorado Springs actually. I've been to Denver several times and I hope one day to come and visit. And when I was preparing for this talk, I found a number of images on the Downtown Partnership website and other websites that connected from there and just beautiful settings, beautiful environment, lots of green space, bike paths. And I was really excited to have this, to give this talk today and just think about the, the backdrop of, of the beautiful setting that, that all of you live in and in your community you live in. And part of the reason why this talk today is so timely is that as we reflect on what has happened, particularly over the last year and a half, where we've seen longstanding inequities in health and we've seen up, upheaval in terms of advancing racial equity and health equity, there has been increased attention on how public spaces can serve or also be a barrier to public health. And as I thought about this presentation for today, I wanted to raise a question and ask, what needs to change to make public spaces safe and healthy for all? And this is the question I would love for you to reflect on with me and I'm going to talk about this today during our time together. So we're gonna talk for maybe the next 35 or 40 minutes or so. Um, and again, please feel free to put questions in the chat, but this is how I'm gonna use our, my time. I'm gonna begin by talking about public spaces as a determinant of health. I'm going to talk about how public spaces can advance equity and health equity in particular. And I will certainly define these terms. And then I will end with a few strategies to create equitable public spaces. Before I go on, I wanna go ahead and, and, and ruin the surprise and tell you the punchline. The public realm or public space pace plays a key role in delivering health equity in cities. Like that is what I'm going to emphasize today in our time together. Public space is so important for health equity and we can advance health equity if we ensure that our public spaces are designed in a way that promote equity, that promote inclusion and accessibility. And I'll talk about how that connects to health and some specific strategies I've been involved in and that I've seen in communities that I've partnered with throughout my career. All right, so let's begin with public spaces as a determinant of health. I wanna begin with this quote. Some of you may be familiar with Richard Jackson or Dick Jackson. He's the former director of the National Center for Environmental Health at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. So if you just bear with me for a moment, I wanna read this because I think it's such a powerful quote to start our time together today. Dick Jackson goes on to say in a talk he was given, I was driving to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention director's office one day for a big meeting on the 21st century health threats. And I saw a woman struggling, walking alongside Buford Highway. And for any of you who have ever been to Atlanta, this is a major, major eight or 10 lane highway in Atlanta. So this woman's walking alongside the highway in 95 degree heat. She was elderly, bent over carrying shopping bags, and she looked like my mother. If she had collapsed and died from exhaustion, the cause of death would likely have been heat stroke it would not have been an absence of trees, 
or an absence of public transportation. And if she had been killed by a truck going by, the cause of death would have been motor vehicle trauma, not absence of sidewalks, not lack of public transportation or poor urban planning. Dick Jackson goes on to say in that same talk that we have forgotten that much of our health is dictated by where we live, what surrounds us all the time. And by where we live, what surrounds us, I mean the schools our kids go to, the parks and green spaces we have access to, our transportation systems, our housing systems, the foods that we can buy and afford to, to buy and have access to, the schools that our kids go to, the school lunches they have, everything that's around us. And these are the things that impact our health. And as a public health person, we call these the social determinants of health. This image that I'm showing you here today is from the County Health Rankings. It's a national program of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And let me just unpack this a little bit for you because what this image emphasizes is, if you look at the top, we see health outcomes and we see health outcomes tend to be defined by your length of life and your quality of life. But I wanna highlight the things that are in the dark black boxes. And that's physical environment, social and economic factors, clinical care and health behaviors. And in that red box is clinical care. And why that's in the red box is that access to healthcare, really important, but it really only comprises about 20% of the variation in health outcomes. You know, we wanna get people to, to doctors, to, um, to medical care, it's really important. And it's more important that we look at all of those other factors in our physical, social, economic environment. Those are the things we broadly call our determinants of health. Now you might say, Vakisha, health behaviors, how are those determinants of health? Well, think about diet and exercise. We can't tell someone to go walk if they're in a community that's not walkable. So we think about those behaviors as resulting from those determinants of health. So from this image, I want you to walk away with thinking and knowing that about 80% of what contributes to our health outcomes are things that happen and are driven by outside of the healthcare system. So if we think about those determinants of health, one of the things that's important to recognize is that multiple sectors influence all of those things I just mentioned, right? So we think about the multiple sectors on health. And so we know that decisions that are made about our school system or about our public transit or about our green spaces, these are decisions that are often made by other sectors and they're not made by our local and state public health departments or our public health professionals. That being said, as a public health person, I partner with these sectors all the time. And I'll come back and talk about the importance of partnership in order to address some of the challenges I'm talking about and to advance health equity. Because we can't just focus on health sectors on itself, we have to partner with planners, with individuals who are working with communities to make communities safe and accessible. There's a role for public health here. This is an image that uh, a friend of mine had sent to me uh, from the World Bank, and I really love this. And it uh, um, really summarizes what do we mean by public spaces. And for some of the, I will read, um, uh, if some of these words look a little small, forgive me, I will certainly read what's on the slide so that everybody can see what's, what's here. So this image just identifies some of the key components of public spaces. So on the left, we see the economic value of public spaces, of how public spaces can create increased economic vitality, can reduce public expenditures on healthcare and urban management, talks about connections with property prices and attracting human capital and business confidence. On the right side of the image is the social value of public spaces, the importance of public spaces for improving quality of life, increased um, uh, actual, uh, what we consider perceived or real safety, um, promoting social equality and equity. Um, increasing cultural vitality, promoting social integration and civic pride and civic engagement. And then at the bottom, it lifts up the environmental value of public spaces. And so things like reduced pollution are listed here, or increased ecological diversity and reduced energy consumption. I'm showing you this image because I just talked about how public spaces are a determinant of health and all of these values that are shown on this image from the World Bank can connect to health 
right? So we think about the social impacts on, uh, of public space on health, like things like social cohesion and social connectedness. We think about the economic value um, or the environmental value. These are all of the ways that public spaces can improve health. And then I'd like to say, let's extend that and conclude and say, well, great public spaces allow for healthy public life. And how does that happen? Well, public spaces can unite us, right? They can sub create and support opportunities for individual health, such as opportunities to walk and bike safely in community and well being. Public spaces can also stimulate our minds and our bodies. Think about the last time you were in your public outside in public space, and maybe it was earlier today. Lots of opportunities often to invite creativity and also activity that we can do individually as in groups. And with thoughtful planning and being intentional, we can cultivate and activate public spaces that can help foster a healthier, more equitable community. So as we think about Colorado Springs and all of the work that's going on to activate and cultivate and promote public spaces, there's also a really important role in terms of fostering inclusion and healthy and equitable communities. One other thing I'll say about public spaces and a healthy public life is that creating public spaces that amplify and lift up health can and should originate from the ground up. Great public spaces reflect what's already there and who's already there. From my experiences, I've seen great public spaces be built and amplified through an inclusive process and sustained by an engaged community. However, we know that not all public spaces are created or maintained equally or equitably, nor are the neighborhoods, towns, or cities that surround them. For example, and this is an infographic from the county health rankings I showed earlier, not every person has the same opportunity to be healthy. We know that residential segregation is a major problem in terms of prohibiting access to certain communities. Um, I know in a place like Colorado Springs where there's lots of green spaces, the city is designed where sometimes people don't have access to certain parts of the city. And I think these are important questions that I know that um, I talk with, with planners about across the country. And I would love to engage with all of you in terms of conversations about that as well. What's the accessibility when we think about people being able to access the spaces that are abundant in Colorado Springs? So I wanted to just present that bit of background before I really dig into health equity and to dig into how public spaces can advance health equity and equity in particular. So I'm gonna just begin this with, a, with this section with a quote from um, Don Bur uh, Berwick, who used to head the, the Centers for Medicaid um, Services, um, Medicare and Medicaid Services of CMS. He's the former head and he once said, every system is perfectly designed to get the results it gets. And so if we think about the system, and I'm going to call the system that produces public spaces and, and whether or not they're equitable as sort of the system, right? So our, our public life system. And we have public spaces that are not created in a way that are equitable or accessible. So Don Burke would say, well, the system is designed to, to do what it does. And if the system is failing, if the outcome is not producing equitable places, then the system's broken. We need to redesign the system. So what do I mean? I mean, we need to redesign how we think about public spaces. How do we redesign, can we, how do we redesign how we approach public spaces in a way that we create them so that we lift up inclusivity and equity? One of the things I think is really important when we talk about this work is making sure that we're clear on the differences between equality and equity. And I'm going to use an illustration from education because, um, and this is something a colleague sent to me and I think it's just so, powerful, and then I'll come back to, um, to public spaces. But I wanted to show you this because I think for, for me and for anyone I've talked to who doesn't completely understand the differences between equality and equity, I think this image really helps. And so if we think about equality, which is really important, right? But equality is only fair and possible if we have an equal world. So for example, if we think about our schools, we talk about things like, I care about all students equally. And what we see in this image are three students all climbing up a ladder to get to that diploma at the top, right? So these, these three students have equal chance to get there. 
But the fact is, is that the world that we live in is not equal. And so what we see here on the left is that these same three individuals, and again, thinking about the school context, the person on the right actually has a number of, of additional platforms to put them closer to that diploma than the other two individuals. And so the things that they're standing on, if you can't see the words, it says scholarships, educated parents, SAT, ACT tutors, middle to upper class income, et cetera. And so those steps have put that person higher and closer, higher on that ladder and closer to reaching their goal of getting that diploma. If we look at the person in the middle, they have a couple of steps as well. They're standing on honors courses, AP credits and highly skilled teachers standing on active social networks and social capital. So again, they too have an increased likelihood of reaching that diploma. They're starting from a different place. But when we think about how the world isn't equal, look at the child on the right. So they're trying to climb that same ladder, but look where that ladder is starting from. It's starting from a place where that child is in a poorly funded schools, where there's less skilled teachers, the counselor ratio to student is one to 1,000. The curriculum is oftentimes truncated, maybe missing books or other parts to really have a comprehensive curriculum. So that same person is trying to reach that diploma as well, but they're starting further behind. And on top of that, on top of having a world that isn't equal, we also live in a world that has bias and systemic racism. And so again, if we look at the same image we just saw on the left, we see that the child on the right, who's already in that hole, starting from that place where they are behind, also is experiencing things like microaggressions, implicit bias, disproportionate remediation and other strategies being in a marginalized group. And so that ladder that they're trying to climb is breaking. It's breaking at key parts. So when you think about it, trying to achieve that same endpoint because of inequities, that ability to climb that ladder is going to be significantly harder. So you might say, well, what about diversity? Well, let's think about that. So with, with the same picture, a diversity lens focuses only on bringing more students into an unequal pathway, unfortunately. Like this is what happens if we don't center equity. If we don't try to address equity. So we're, we're bringing more and more people. Let's have a more diverse body of, of students. Let's have more students of color, students from different backgrounds, but they're still on that broken ladder trying to climb to achieve that outcome of graduation. But if we were to go ahead and center equity, we would redirect those resources to fix that ladder, to invest where the greatest need is, to fix barriers and intentionally provide support for those kids who started on that ladder that was broken. And so what we see here on this, in this image is um, a fire truck fixing the pieces of the ladder, putting the ladder together with things like goal setting and action planning, faculty and staff training, et cetera. And so I described this example again in the education space because I think this, um, uh, this is a really clear way to lay out these concepts. And I wanna take this back now to, as we think about public space, I do a lot of work in public space and transportation, and we can think about that same image. What we have here on the top of the slide is an approach to active transportation or bicycling that lifts up equality. So that means every person gets the same exact bicycle. But what we see on the bottom part of the slide is an approach that lifts up equity and centers equity. So that means that we are looking to see where every single, what every single person needs. What does, every, what does every group need in order to all be able to safely travel? So we see a person on the left who has a disability, who has a bicycle with a hand crank so that they can ride. We see the person in the middle who has a bike that fits them. Um, another person next to that person who's a woman, um, looks like a woman, female gender, who has a bike that's a little bit smaller. And then we see all the way on the end, a, a child represented in this image who has a bike that fits their size. So again, I lift this up to say, as we think about public spaces, as we think about promoting equity, we have to think about, well, what are, where are people starting from? Where are communities that have been historically disinvested or marginalized? And how do we intentionally direct resources to get them to the place where they can thrive and achieve good health. So speaking of good health, 
this is what we mean when we talk about health equity. So I just talked about equity and equality in the context of health, health equity is defined as the absence of unfair and avoidable differences in health and well-being among groups defined socially, economically, demographically, or geographically. So we can think about equity in terms of rural and urban, in terms of race, ethnicity, um, in terms of socioeconomic status, et cetera. And in order to achieve health equity, we have to address those underlying determinants of health, which takes us back to where we started from today. So those social, economic, political, and physical determinants of health. So we have to think of things like racism and poverty, lack of access to quality public spaces, transportation, et cetera. And if we address those things, we can move forward in advancing health equity where every single person, regardless of where they were born, the color of their skin can thrive in terms of health. But we have to address these underlying factors. So how might public spaces advance health equity? Well, in many ways. So first, public spaces can advance health equity by being both accessible and welcoming to all. Creating spaces where people feel like they belong, they feel like they're able to use the spaces. I worked on a project with the community where we were amplifying, uh, we were creating play streets, so turning streets into places for kids to play safely, kids who, didn't, who lived in communities that didn't have access to safe parks and playgrounds. And one community actually was very near um, a park, a park that was beautiful. It was in a, a part of um, a state that had a lot of tourists. And when I talked to the residents who lived right near that park, they said that they didn't feel like that space was for them. They felt like the parks were for the tourists who come to town every year and really sort of take over this, this community. And so the residents who lived adjacent to this park Places for the kids to play safely felt like the space was never designed for them. And so that's a barrier when we think about how do we amplify public spaces because there are so many benefits to outdoor public spaces and, and all of you who are watching can list those off. But what a missed opportunity for the kids to have places to play when instead they're inside, particularly when parents were at work and, and these kids are unable to come outside. Um, because of concerns. Um, I, I grew up as a quote unquote latchkey kid. I don't know if we still call kids that today. Um, but if so, these are kids who are home. They're, a lot of their guardians and parents were at work and they couldn't leave. And here we have, they were next to this very beautiful piece of green space and they felt like it wasn't designed for them. Public spaces can also advance health equity by reflecting shared social values such as dignity and respect and these are important. It's important to know what the social values are of the communities who the spaces are designed for. Public spaces can also advance health equity by demonstrating the value of processes. So having, using inclusive processes, I'm gonna talk in a moment about inclusion and inclusivity as a process and an outcome. So having inclusive processes where communities can talk about what the space means can promote trust, particularly amongst historically marginalized groups. So centering community, bringing groups that are at the margins to the center. Public spaces can also advance health equity by promoting vibrant and diverse social interaction. How are the, do the spaces promote interactions? Do the spaces, do they have enough lighting or do they have enough places for people to sit down? Um, I remember being in a community where park, uh, there was very little use in this park. And I remember talking to someone and I had asked what was happening here? And this gentleman said, there's no restrooms here. I can't really be here for a long time. There's no public restrooms here. And so when you think about people wanting to connect, wanting to spend time in public spaces, I remember being in communities where they were lacking amenities where people even wanted to stay for a long time. Um, and so they needed to leave because there was no access to public um, restrooms. Public spaces can also advance health equity by offering everyone opportunities to use and enjoy the public spaces in diverse ways whether it's for physical activity or just for relaxation. They can also help in terms of health, in terms of the numerous benefits for physical, mental, and emotional health of access to green spaces. And finally, public spaces can advance health equity by supporting and sustaining the natural assets and the strengths of a place and its people. 
I would be remiss if I didn't mention the important role of racism in public space. And I wanna acknowledge my colleague, Charles Brown, who has talked about um, arrested mobility and has coined this term. And, and he defines arrested mobility as the assertion that black people and other people of color that have been historically and, and, and uh, denied by legal and illegal authority the inalienable right to move or to be moved or simply to exist in public spaces. And so what he talks about is who are public spaces designed for? Are they safe and welcoming to all people? What can we do to ensure that spaces are for everyone? where people don't feel that they are racially profiled or that the space is not for a certain race or ethnicity or other demographic group. I think this hit home for many individuals last year in 2020, in February 2020, after the death of Ahmaud Arbery, who um, in Georgia we know was out um, running and was murdered. And after that, after his death of this young unarmed black man, uh, candidate for, for president at the time, Kamala Harris, tweeted and said, exercising while Black should not be a death sentence. And for those of us in public health, particularly those who do work trying to promote physical activity and active transportation, walking and biking to, to get around, really began, I think, in a new way to look at what's the role of racial equity in terms of space and in terms of safety and who is space designed for. And I know that I was invited to have conversations with several public health agencies at our federal and state and local levels to talk about racial equity in particular with public spaces, particularly for individuals who want to promote public spaces as a way for people to get physical activity and to promote health. Well, we can't do that if people are afraid to even go out and walk and bike and run because of the color of their skin. So you might be thinking, well, what do we do about this? Well, there are lots of strategies. I'm gonna to turn to a few. I'm gonna reflect on some of my own work and experiences and the privilege that I've had to be in community with individuals across this country and thinking about how do we create equitable public spaces? The first thing I wanna do is lift up uh, Gail Associates. I've worked with Gail and I'll talk about a project I work with Gail um, uh, Institute in, in a moment. But Gale Associates is a, a, a firm, I think many of you are familiar with Gale, and they talk about making public space for people. And I, and I remember when I was involved in a project with Gale and had a chance to go on a, a study tour of certain communities uh, in the US and around the world, and they really lift up having, putting people first and having quality public space and being so essential for quality of life and the importance of designing public spaces for people and thinking about that in terms of walking and biking, thinking about life in between buildings and ensuring that there's places for people to gather, amenities for people to get to. And again, thinking about designing spaces for people first. It was under this, this sort of backdrop that I had the privilege of partnering with Gail and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to design a framework and a guide called Inclusive Healthy Places. We started this work back in 2016. And at the time, despite the growing evidence connecting place and health and design and physical activity, there were really few resources to help planners and policymakers and community members identify the type of evidence that was needed to help make decisions and fund public space projects that promote individual and community health and well being. Similarly, at the time, though inclusion as a concept was well discussed, we found that there was no clear shared working definition that could be tested and measured in design and public health practice. So we focused on public outdoor spaces and together with researchers, planners, designers, architects, community members came up with this framework to design inclusive, healthy places. The framework is a tool. It's an adaptable tool to help you evaluate and create healthy, inclusive public spaces that support health equity. And when we put this tool together, we viewed inclusion as a process. So lifting up an inclusive process to create these spaces and to amplify existing spaces and also an outcome. So the spaces that are present at, at the end of this can be inclusive. And finally, inclusion was viewed as a tool for change, 
a way to help shift power, which is critical when we think about advancing equity. Here are the guiding principles that we used for our work. The first was to recognize community context. And you know, so many times we, I think we um, think about community deficits when it's really about cultivating knowledge of the existing conditions and assets and lived experiences from community members that relate to health equity. Our second guiding principle was around supporting inclusion in the processes that shape public space by promoting civic trust, participation and social capital. In particular, we talked about how we need to move marginalized communities from the margins to the center. And that is a real way to have and promote equity. Our third guiding principle was to design and program public space for health equity. And to do that by improving the quality of the spaces, to enhance access and safety of those spaces and to invite diversity into those spaces. And finally, our last guiding principle was to foster social resilience and capacity of local communities to engage with the changes in place over time by promoting representation, agency, and stability. And so this was about co-creating space that was designed and led and supported by community members and the principles and the framework that we developed give you really tangible ways to do this in practice. And the link to the documents at the bottom of each of these slides, I'm going to show you a few screenshots and just kind of walk you through what's in the tool in case you're interested in, in using it in your work. The way that we design this tool is that to create inclusive healthy places, practitioners should adopt a process that we feel incorporates a cycle of action, evaluation and adaptation. You know, public spaces are dynamic, as are the communities who use them and depend on them. And as inclusion and health equity can shift and our approach to the project to really be responsive to changing needs of communities and to monitoring and evaluating the spaces to achieve better outcomes. And so what you see here at the top of this slide is what I, is what I talked about in terms of that cycle of plan, design, do, measure, and then adapt. And we, we believe that this cycle is how um, we can use the tool to advance those spaces. And across the bottom, we just wanted to lift up how this, this framework can be used for public spaces at various scales. So think about public space like a plaza redesign or a community garden project, all the way through to neighborhood level strategies, such as a renewal program for an urban district or construction of a regional destination waterfront park to community level strategies, such as writing or developing a resiliency strategy for urban waterfront parks or a mobility plan or an environmental justice campaign, all the way to regional or national efforts, such as an environmental cleanup project or a regional health framework plan. I list these various buckets of, of, of activity because the framework that we created is adaptable. It, it can be shaped and applied to whatever your context and whatever scale is appropriate for your work. Now I'm gonna show you an image and I know this is really small but I just lifted this out of the document and I encourage you to look at the document to look and see what we have. But I wanted to show you, this is right out of the document. We actually spent a lot of time coming up with a set of in interconnected drivers indicators and metrics to help practitioners build inclusion into their public space projects, to use it to increase health equity and assess its effects. So if you look in the middle of this diagram, we see the four um, guiding principles I just mentioned. And then what's around it are various indicators and metrics. So for example, on the right top quadrant, you see social capital and participation um, as important um, drivers, and then we um, list a number of ways that you can measure that. So we have very specific details on if you want to measure social capital and see how you're doing in that in your work, here's how you do that. If you want to measure participation or civic trust or community assets, etc, collective e efficacy. So I mentioned this and I'm just showing you this model so that you can look and see all of the ways that as you're doing your work, you can measure and look to see if how you are promoting health and inclusion and health equity in, in, your, in your projects, in your public space projects.
So that was a very specific project I wanted to share. I also now want to share some sort of general strategies and best practices for achieving health equity in public space from my own work and also recognizing and lifting up work from others in the field that I respect. Um, the first thing I think is really important is to acknowledge history. I think so many times the tendency is to connect with community and so let's go engage with community. And quite frankly, I have been um, in communities where there is, where it's important to acknowledge the history and the trauma and distrust that is probably there and it's been there for decades and centuries. And it's important to acknowledge this history and to name the structural racism that's, that's created that and to make space to unpack these perspectives because for many communities, there is distrust there, there's mistrust and thinking about, well, how do we move forward in advancing health equity? How do we get communities from the margin to the center? We have to make space to understand the context and the history and to be able to name the kind of future that we all want together and through that collective vision to move things forward. A second general strategy is around promoting democracy. Um, Chanel Wiggum from, from the Ohio State, who's the Ohio State Director for Trust for Public Land was cited as saying, the work to provide equitable access to green spaces is inextricably linked with helping people in disinvested neighborhoods participate in shared decision-making and public processes. So there's a role for a democracy here. And by democracy on meeting, involving residents, involving communities, particularly people who've been in neighborhoods or live in neighborhoods or are parts of communities that tend to not be at the table. So this is about shifting power, building power, giving people a voice in the decisions that are affecting them. Another strategy is to advance racial equity. I talked, to, I presented that definition earlier on health equity and talked about how achieving health equity will require us to address racism. But we have to address racial equity and think about geographic inequities in terms of distribution of green spaces and even when there's a lot of green spaces across an area, like in Colorado Springs, ensuring these spaces are inclusive. How do we lift up an anti-racism perspective to promote access to green spaces? Another general strategy is, is really thinking about how do we address um, BIPOC, so Black, Indigenous, and people of color, um, particular racism. I, I mentioned earlier the Ahmaud Arbery example, um, and it's important that we need to name it and address those power imbalances that I talked about earlier, especially with communities who have histories of exclusion and marginalization. I also think that there's a real need to champion inclusive outdoors as a right. Um, you know, thinking about who do we see in this, in this work, involved in this work, advocating for this work? Um, do we have people of color who are um, involved in increasing inclusivity around opportunities for recreation, um, who are at the table when decisions are being made around planning? Um, and some of that relates back to the work that I do as a, as a professor in an, in, at an institution and making sure we're bringing people into the field, into the pipeline. Um, and then some of it relates to also making sure we're hiring people into spaces that can bring these diverse experiences and lived experiences and can be partners as we promote health equity in public spaces. And finally, another strategy is around co-producing spaces. And I mentioned this earlier. So co-producing co spaces involves connecting with communities, making sure community voice and making sure the voices of the people whose spaces are, are are, uh, are using the spaces, have talked about why they use the space, what they want that space to look like and to be, and making sure that we are working together and in partnership to promote health equity in space. I wanna also mention the important opportunity um, and need in terms of traveling to and from spaces. Right, I've talked a lot about public spaces and, and how to make those spaces equitable, it is my perspective that everyone deserves safe and easy access to parks as well, but we know that not all people in neighborhoods have that opportunity. So as we think about pedestrian safety, bicycle safety and accessibility, I wanted to show this infographic, which is from the National Safe Routes to School Partnership, um, emphasizing the importance of having safe routes to parks and, and strategies that we can use to create those safe routes to park. And so this, this infographic lifts up doing safety audits with community members, engaging the neighborhood um, to be part of creating those routes, 
um, celebrating the benefits. We know that people who live near green spaces are more likely to visit those green spaces and be more physically active. I'm um, really lifting up safety, um, promoting strategies and understanding how people perceive safety in spaces and what needs to happen to improve safety in the spaces. Again, if you're interested in specific strategies here or, or this infographic, I direct you to the Safe Routes to School National Partnership. I mean, as we're coming to the end of our time, I want to say, well, a word on the pandemic. Um, this is an image from colleagues of mine at IS Global. Um, you know, there's been so much discussion about well, what's going to happen as we as we you know, come to the end of the pandemic as we sort of um, return to work, to school, et cetera. And there has been a lot of people have written about, well, how cities and public spaces is going to evolve, right? There are questions around, you know, are, is there gonna be a mass exodus from big cities, right? Where people who have the resources are gonna move out to the suburbs and are young people gonna come in? Um, there have been people questioning, you know, are we gonna see changes in who uses public spaces and how? We've seen a large number of people um, embrace outdoors and public spaces during the pandemic. Um, what's gonna happen? What are, are those trends, those changes we've seen, are they going to be sustained? I think we, we, we're looking to see what happens there. There's also questions about, will more public space be given over to pedestrians and cyclists? Here in Baltimore, I was involved in helping to advocate for safe streets and closing streets down um, to allow space for more walking and biking during the pandemic, during the recovery. What does that look like? How do we sustain those efforts? And also we know that the pandemic is making cities greener and more sustainable. And so as we think about what that means, how, do, how again do we sustain these efforts as we think about coming out of the pandemic? I wanna mention a project that I was involved in in Baltimore this past summer that we hope is going to uh, sustain the changes that we've seen. We hope this changes in the, to public space will be sustained as we transition out from, from the pandemic. And through an effort with the city of Baltimore, the mayor's office, um, the Baltimore Development Corporation and the organization I work with, the Neighborhood Design Center, there was an effort to develop a guidebook a uh, called Design for Distancing. And it was designed to lift up temporary public space interventions in a number of city districts that would involve innovative approaches, approaches excuse me, to local businesses and an emphasis on public health and safety, really thinking about how do we promote businesses and promote people being using businesses in a way that's safe and again, can promote sustainability. So in a very innovative way, what happened was that there was, um, I was, I led the public health team that put out some public health guidance that are included in that design for distancing book. And there was actually a competition where design teams there were over 160 submissions. And then there was a jury that selected the top 10 designs. Um, and the guidance that they received are uh, here are some of the, the key guidance that they received are, is listed here on the slide where the design teams were told to design spaces that are inclusive, healthy, and equitable, that would support a return to thriving businesses in Baltimore, that would leverage assets of the community and amplify the existing character of the surrounding neighborhood. Spaces that would leverage community assets, um, be spaces that people would actually use, um, spaces that would have messaging that was culturally appropriate and even in languages um, for that neighborhood, the dominant languages. Um, are safe and that actually could be executable in a very short time frame. And so again, this process moved forward. Um, I, was, I was one of the judges, including a number of other people, and we picked um, many spaces that were then um, implemented in the city, which is really exciting. And I'll just show you, this is an example of um, one of the designs that came in uh, to create a micro district um, in, in one of the corridors downtown where you see opportunities for for play, opportunities for engagement, opportunities for, for safe spaces to, um, to eat, to go into shops. So this was just one of the winning designs that came out of that process. Um, here's another one, and this was around how do we reorganize the street um, in terms, and again, this was a street that was closed down. Uh, and so how can we extend businesses into the street where then people are able to um, eat safely, be outside, uh, be physically distanced. And I know that public health guidance has changed since last summer, 
but several of these strategies have continued uh, in Baltimore. And actually one of my students is now um, uh, studying implementation and evaluating this work. So she's doing interviews with people on the, uh, on the streets and business owners and design teams and trying to understand, you know, what are the lessons we can learn from this and how can we sustain these efforts if that's part of what the, what, um, because we know that the community has talked about wanting to see these efforts sustained. So I wanna wrap up with just some final comments. Just to go back to my original statement, public spaces are essential for achieving health equity. And I think it is critical for all of us as we are engaged in this work to ask, well, who is the public spaces that we're creating for? What is our intent and what is happening out in practice? Do people feel like space is accessible for them to be in? I think it's critical to acknowledge the history and the context and to understand where we've been in order to move forward collectively. And it's important, I believe, to name the future we want, a future where communities can thrive and can feel safe and feel welcomed when they go into public spaces. I think it's important as we engage in this work to lift up community participation and responsive, authentic engagement and inclusive processes as we seek to amplify public spaces. As a public health person, I wanna lift up the importance of multi-sectoral partnerships. So working with planners and designers, um, public health partners are a great, um, public health is a great partner on this work. If you're not already engaged with your public health um, colleagues, I encourage you to do so. And finally, health equity involves working with, not on affected communities. Um, and, I, and I love this image here. It says, keep your coins, I want change. And so I will, I will leave you with that today. Um, here's my contact information. I encourage you to reach out if you have questions that we don't get to today, or um, if my, my work or anything I said resonates with you and you want to have a follow-up conversation, I welcome it. Um, so thank you very much. Oh, wow, Dr. Pollock Porter, that was um, an incredible uh, overview and amount of information to really digest. It's gonna give me a lot to think about for a long time. And we, we had a couple folks also ask for um, copies of some of the charts and frameworks you shared. So if that's okay with you, we'd love to get that to, to share with folks. Uh, but Tila, I'm gonna turn it over to you now. I've seen a couple questions in the chat and you may also have questions yourself, Tila, if you wanna um, help lead us through the Q&A. Absolutely, thank you. And yes, Dr. Dr. Porter, Paul, Porter Pollock, sorry about that. Oh, you can um, totally call me Keisha. Totally fine. Thank you, Keisha. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, really inspiring and the visuals were amazing. So one thing I wanna touch on is you, you talked about shifting power and building power and how important that is. Uh, so one question I do have is how do you get those who currently have the power comfortable with the idea of shifting power? Oh, Tila, that is such a great question. Um, thank you for asking it. Um, I, and I, I suspect people on this call um, maybe are wondering or have good strategies for that as well. I, you know, I, I um, would say that when I think about the work that I've done, um, I, I wanna answer it another way by saying, um, there's resistance to these strategies and a lot of it comes from fear is what I've, it was fear. And I, you know, and I've talked to people and said, you know, shifting power doesn't mean that that you no longer have a voice, right? And it's and it's for me, it's been a, a part of a lesson in talking about well, how can we just bring the value of bringing more people to the table? And it's and to me, it's not about you losing and somebody else gaining. It's about sharing. It's sharing powder, power. Excuse me. It's sharing power, right? And so I think that it's part of it is part of it is is um, really challenging the narrative that says that if we're gonna share power, that means you're losing something, right? To me, we're all gaining. We're all gaining because there's benefits of having more voices, more people at the table. We have similar goals. So why not have a more inclusive process that involves communities that can make decisions and be around the table? I think the other part of this too that I would say, um, and, and I'm just gonna ask it, speak to another part of your question that you, that you didn't ask, which is, you know, how do we also get the people who haven't had power to believe that we really genuinely want to shift power, right? Particularly when communities have been marginalized for so long. And part of it is showing up, authentic engagement, being there. Um, I know as I'm a researcher and I work with communities and I can tell you there have been so many times I've gone back after the work is done and people are like, you're back. You showed up. I said, I told you I would. He said, so many people don't show up, 
right? Or people make decisions for us without talking to us. And so I think this gets to some of the strategies I talked about earlier of promoting inclusion um, and, and having opportunities for voice and making space for those conversations. Thank you. That's an excellent answer. Um, and I want to delve in a little bit more on that and that showing up. Um, and can you talk a little bit about how, how do you do that? Right. So practically, we all know we have to show up. We have to build trust. Um, is there a length of time? What if the community isn't so welcoming at the at the forefront? Right. Um, are there any tools that you can suggest about how to make yourselves more accessible to the community? Yeah, thank you, Tila, for that. And um, uh... I'm sure there are many tools and I'll just reflect on my own experiences. Um, you know, it's interesting. So, so for me as a, as a black woman, even when I go into communities of color, I'm still perceived as an outsider, right? Sometimes not just about that people look like me. Um, at the end of the day, people know that I, uh, I, you know, work at an institution that has history, right? And so, so I acknowledge that I come in with humility um, and I think being uh, uh, having that humility is so critical and recognizing and being open to learning, right? Letting, reminding people that they are the experts. You are the experts in your community. I'm there to learn from you and to work with you. And I'm here to listen and genuinely listen. And I think one of the things we can do sometimes is we end up causing harm when we hear from people and we don't listen and we don't take the, their perspectives and then actually implement them. Um, I, there's a, I remember there was an effort to um, uh, expand bicycling um, uh, in a community that I was connected to. And the city talked to the residents and the residents were against um, having a bike lane installed for a number of reasons in this community. And the local department of transportation did it any, anyway, right on that same block. And so the community felt like, well, wait a second, we showed up at all these meetings that you invited us to. We told you these are the reasons why we didn't want this bicycle, this bike lane installed here, but you did it anyway. Um, there was so much harm in that community from that one decision that I will say actually that Department of Transportation later removed those bike lanes. Um, and, and I say that, I give that example as just, um, uh, an ex I just give that story as an example of how we can ignore the voices even when we reach out to them and like that is part of um, causing the harm. And you know, those people showed up and they appeared to be listening. Maybe their intent was to listen, but what they were hearing, they didn't put into practice. And so I think for me, it's around humility, it's listening, it's active listening, and it's following through on what we are doing and actually naming that vision again, as I said, for the future, naming the kind of society that we want together with our community partners. Okay, and, and another question from uh, attendee here. Uh, interested in your thoughts on Portland, Oregon, until recently held up as a great urban place, but now by many accounts, sad, boarded up and depressive, inclusive, but no longer equitable. Yeah, I, I think, the, um, you know, I, I haven't been to Portland a long time and, and certainly Portland was a place that we lifted up as also a place that promoted bicycling and a number of other things. You know, I, I would say that um, whether it's Portland or other cities that we have seen shift in terms of a number of, of, of indicators, right? Whether it's crime, whether it's uh, a lack of affordable housing, all of these things. I think this gets back to what I talked about earlier, which is the important role of social determinants of health in these other sectors. I think that we, um, need to think about where are we investing our resources and what does it mean to live in a city where people can thrive? Like, what does it mean, right? What does it mean to have good schools, to have safe communities? Um, what is that vision for the community? And do we have leadership that's going to be held accountable for working with community and working across sectors to make those changes? And so that's sort of a broader comment and not specifically about Portland, because I do think that, 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 that those perspectives are relevant to many other places in this country. Um, I say that uh, not having been in Portland recently to know exactly what's happening on the ground, um, but I acknowledge that um, Portland, like many other cities have changed. Um, and I do think we need to think about uh, investing and focusing on social determinants of health, making sure people can send their kids to, to good schools, they can afford um, uh, safe and good quality housing, 
They have access to green spaces that are safe. They have transportation systems that get them to and from jobs that pay living wages. Like I think all of these system level changes are important for a thriving city. So um, I hope that I answered your question, but those are my thoughts on, on Portland, which I think is what the question uh, was, sort of was broadly asked as. Yes, and I, I do think, you know, it's always interesting and cities reach this arc and uh, you wonder how can you preserve that really great space that you're at where you are equitable and, and not have to experience all of a sudden that disenfranchisement that sometimes occurs. Mm -hmm. um, another person has asked here, uh, if, there, if you're not employed with the city or a community organization, how can you get involved and help create priorities for health equity? I, I love that question. Um, I, I am a, a big fan of, of citizen involvement in government processes. Um, I, I don't, I, you know, I would sort of also invite you and your colleagues from from the area to, to share some specific strategies here. Um, but but I would certainly say get involved, make sure your voice is heard whenever those processes are open, where there's um, town meetings or um, ways that that I know here in Baltimore, I can just reflect on there are often are plans when they are proposed, people can comment on them, there are public hearings. Um, I will acknowledge that there are times when those meetings are held at times that are not accessible to communities, right? And so I think that that's an issue. Um, I was involved in an effort in the city where, where we would hold town hall meetings at nine o'clock at night and at three o'clock in the afternoon. But when you hold them at three o'clock in the afternoon, there's a certain amount, number of people who aren't gonna be able to access them. Um, so I would say, um, I'm uh, assuming and hoping that the process is accessible where your voice can be engaged. And I think part of it too is learning on the, about these strategies. Um, uh, again, I think understanding how change happens and understanding where communities can, can express their, their perspectives and their thoughts in these different plans. And so um, maybe um, Tila, if, if you have specifics based on yeah. your experience or Susan, um, in, terms of, in terms of your area, that'd be great. Yeah, absolutely. There is uh, no lack of public processes that occur in the city of Colorado Springs. And so those are always on the city's website. And I do believe that many organizations also work with the city to promote those opportunities as well. The city also has board and commission opportunities. So if you wanted to get in on a little bit of a deeper level, certainly welks it. It is open to citizens and, and we hope that they apply with an interest in advancing those areas. You know, we here at Parks have um, our parks board, um, just one example of how citizens can get involved and help to advance this work. But there are also citizen-based organizations as well. So um, certainly I would say uh, reach out to me if you have any questions, I'd be happy to connect you and find a little bit more about what your interest might be. Um, another question we have here is, um, so we don't always get one voice from the community right? It's not like the community will come at you with one cohesive idea of what they want. You get multiple conflicting ideas. Um, is there a way to manage those? And how do you explain to the various opinions and people who have those di di divisive opinions? Yeah, I really appreciate this question. You know, I, I certainly many times during our time together talked about community and the community. I acknowledge community is not monolithic. There are many, many voices in the community and voices that have different lived experiences, voices that do not always agree, um, maybe rarely agree sometimes. Um, and I really appreciate um, uh, the question and the comment in the chat that, that relates to this. You know, I um, have certainly been able to attend meetings where there were various opinions. Um, I, and I find that it's really important though to create space where, where those various perspectives are captured, even if they're, if they're going to be different, right? So I think about even meetings that um, I had to the earlier question too, I've, I've, I've sat on our, our Baltimore City's uh, uh, bicycle advisory committee, or, our, or I volunteer for that, or our pedestrian safety committee, which is a way that I've been able to um, uh, to voice my thoughts and my opinions and bring some expertise in terms of public health, um, or also just going because of open meetings. I can go to these things when I have time to attend, and I would say even I will share a thought that other people don't don't agree with. So, for example, I I do a lot of work around bicycle safety and talk about helmets, and um, a lot of people don't agree with me when we talk about helmets. And, uh, and as a public health person, I will always promote helmets when we're riding. And I've been in meetings where people have 
said very angry things to me about that. And, um, and I appreciate that. I think there's room for various perspectives. And then we really need to take a step back and ask, well, what are the goals of what we're doing? Right. And, and it's okay. We can respectfully agree to disagree. And that is fine. I think having various perspectives is a wonderful thing. I think the challenge comes to, well, how do we reconcile those different voices and actually move forward um, and, and do it in a way where people don't feel like they weren't heard. Um, and so I know when I engage with, with the city and when I'm involved in other projects is making sure I want to acknowledge that to people that I've heard them, I've considered their, their perspectives and also explaining why or why not we're moving in a certain direction, particularly if there's a direction that maybe goes against what some voices in the room said. I think that's part of relationship building and transparency and building trust. And I will tell you that in those times, even people who disagreed with me have said, I respect you and I respect how you handled that, even though we don't see eye to eye. Um, so I would say uh, as, as you engage in work with, it's important to get various voices and perspectives, be honest and transparent about how decisions are being made so that people understand um, if their voices or perspectives are going to be used in the decision-making process. Okay, and I'm going to ask um, a, a question from Nancy. Nancy, I'm hoping that I paraphrased your question accurately. Chime in if I haven't. How might those of us on this call individually and collectively address how structural racism inherently works against the use of a tool such as inclusive healthy places in the work of entities responsible for the planning and development of public spaces? That is a big question, uh, and so I appreciate um, I appreciate you asking that. Um, so I would say the the first thing that is really important is to um, is to name racism, right? And and that might sound so simple, um, but I'm in rooms and spaces all the time where um, well, I won't say all the time, but several times where people still question the kinds of data I showed you today, or would say that's not racism. People, choose, people chose to live in that neighborhood that, don't ha that doesn't have access to parks or, or healthy foods. No, actually there's a history of policies that prohibited people from living in those communities, right? And so I think we have to acknowledge that racism exists, that there's history there. Um, and we have to acknowledge the trauma that comes from that as we want to partner in an authentic way with, with communities. Um, so I think that that is a really important place to start. That's the first thing. The second thing is gets back to one of the points I made on the final slide, which is about when we are partnering with um, communities, we have to work together to dismantle um, structural racism. We have to work together to understand or to name what are those systems that have that continue to exacerbate um, uh, racism. And related to that, we have to lift up anti-racism policies, anti-racist practices. So what does that mean? It's um, as we know, um, uh, it, it describes not just focusing on being non-racist, we need to be anti-racist where we are actively moving forward to dismantle racism, that we are lifting up policies where we are explicitly looking to go against things that are going to continue to produce racism. Um, and so, and this is really important. Um, and I think that this is a part of, of what we can include in our practice. And so one of the things, if you look at inclusive healthy places, you might say, well, you know, where does racism fit? Well, using an anti-racist lens and overlaying that is critical to advance health equity there. Um, so in terms of all of the practices we're talking about, even measuring racism, measuring it, what, what does that mean? And, and finally, the thing I'll say is moving away from just focusing on race, Right? So race is important, but it's really about racism. And I say that as a researcher, where so many times we say, let's look at differences between this racial group or this racial group. It's really about racism. It's, it's the mechanism. Race is a social construct. It's not some biological factor. Right, This is a social construct, and it's really important to understand how racism is contributing to the communities that we care about and that we want to work with. And I think all of that together can help us make the kinds of changes we're interested in. And I saw a comment on radical hospitality. I wanna lift that up. I think that is absolutely right. Um, uh, I think radical hospitality is a great theme um, and way to think about how do we engage with community and engage with um, our residents and neighbors. Well, on that note, we can close it out as the end of the Q&A. I think that is a great 
great theme to end on radical hospitality. Thank you so much, Dr. Pollock Porter, for your words of wisdom today. It has been really inspiring for Colorado Springs. Susan, would you like to close us out? Well, and I will say as well, on behalf of Downtown Partnership, as well as our sponsors, the Colorado Springs Health Foundation and tonight's sponsor, Kono, and also to our, our participants tonight, great questions. Um, so thank you again, Kishi. My wine is just spinning with um, how to apply so much of what we talked about today. Um, truly inspiring. We thank you so much for your time. We welcome you to Colorado Springs. We'd love to have you here and, and um, truly, uh, I think you've given us so much good food for thought and actionable um, things as well. So thank you again. Thank you all who've joined us for City Center Series. And like we said, we'll be back next year. And um, we appreciate um, all your time and have a wonderful evening, everyone. Thank you all. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Tila. Thanks, Claire. Thanks, Jan. Take care, everyone.